Good evening to all participants of Europe. Good afternoon for those people of North and South America. Good night for the people of India and Korea. And thanks for being with us in the darkest hour of your night. And good morning for people from Australia and New Zealand. It is really wonderful and we are happy that we can organize this way of communication with each other from all parts over the world. On behalf of the whole International Board of ISPS, I welcome you for the first International ISPS webinar. It's a little bit exciting for us, but it was really a pleasure to do it. COVID-19 has made many victims and we are so sad because many lost their lives in terrible circumstances. That the disease can be traumatic is beautifully illustrated by an Italian film made by Massimo Leopardi of his interview with Dr. Luca Gavatta, who went through all the stages of the disease. Antonia uploaded this moving film this week on the YouTube ISPS channel, and I invite you to take a look at it. It's really impressive. In many places of the world, people are recovering from the crisis, but there are still places where the virus is very active and bring people and governments in painful situations. These different stages of the pandemic do not disturb us to bring our minds together. Despite the misery COVID-19 has caused and still continues to cause, we see solidarity between people and we see how people ask themselves existential questions like what really matters in life. With the General Board of ISPS, we found it important to be near with you. And this is during a period we still have to take social distance. Because we know that human proximity is the basis to deal with the traumatic experience of a pandemic. A webinar gives us the opportunity to make contact with you all. We would like that you take a minute to tell us if you mainly identify yourself as a person with lived experience, a family member, or a medical health professional. Antonia will share the poll question on the screen and you have about 30 seconds to respond and afterwards Antonia will show the result briefly. So we can start with it, I think. It's running. Do you mainly identify as a mental health professional, a family member or a care of someone with a psychosis of someone with lived experience of psychosis? of others. Please take some time to do this. Wow. Many mental health professionals. Uh, I expect also many people with lived experience and family members. Uh, but welcome to all of you. <laughs> okay, thank you. We are very grateful to Ray Weddingham of UK. Please, Ray, raise your hand. Yeah, there. And to Deborah Lamsher of New Zealand that they agreed to moderate the panel discussions with three persons. First of all, Barry Floyd, welcome, Barry, a man with lived experience and working in the field of mental health in New York. Secondly, Bert Stavenauter, uh, he's a family member from the Netherlands. And finally, our Dag Söderström, a professional psychiatrist from Switzerland and member of our EC. Welcome, Dag. As announced, Deborah Lemshaw will moderate the discussion in the second part. In the beginning of the second part, Margrethe Pater, we all know her from the ISPS conference in Rotterdam, will give a short summary of all the stories ISPS collected the last week, and they are very grateful to this. 
on the panel here, you see also Cicely Almas eh, from Norway. There, Cicely. Eh? She will manage the time here. She also uh, some, gave a summary of the stories we received. Um, I will also like to introduce you Jen Killian from UK. Hello, Jen. And Mariana Karjalainen from Finland, who will collect the chats and the Q&As for a discussion for the moderators. And afterwards, I will also make a summary. And we are also very grateful to Julie Kip, Julie there, huh? from um, the States, who brought us in contact with Barry Floyd and gave him the technical assistance so that everything will pass well this evening or this afternoon. And last but not least, least there is also Antonia Svensson, um, who she did a lot of work and she will manage us during uh, this webinar. First, I give the word to Wei. Most of all, most of us know that she is an open dialogue practitioner and an international trainer. She has created, established, and managed innovative hearing voices network projects in different settings. Um, she already participated and as panelist and as a host of several webinars, and she will guide us during this session also today. Before she starts with the discussion. She will first give some explanations how it works with respect for the rules of the confidentiality. Way I give you the word. Thank you, Ludi. Ah, oh, it's um, really exciting to be here, isn't it? Um, yeah. And wow, we've got 92 people here so far. Before we get going with the panel, um, Ludi asked me to just introduce you to the Zoom format so that you can take part in it um, as an active member. What um, you've probably noticed on the right hand side, you should see the chat stream. You're really welcome. You can hear my baby maybe in the background trying to go to sleep. You're really welcome to type any thoughts, comments, connect with each other. That can be a really busy place. Um, you should also see the Q&A um, function, which is at the bottom of your screen, two little um, speech bubbles. If you click on that, you'll see that you can write questions and you can respond to other people's questions. If you want panel or well, with the panel to engage with your thoughts or questions, please write them in the Q&A so they don't get lost on the chat. Um, at the moment, we're just going to be taking part through the, um, the chat, but maybe if there's time and space, we might open up for you to use your audio and join us in the room if you want to say your question in person. But we might just stick with the simple thing for our first webinar. In terms of um, privacy, you might notice that we're being streamed live on YouTube. We have reached the 21st century. Um, brilliant. You might wonder what that means. All it means is that those who are unable to come into the Zoom room are able to go to our YouTube channel, ISPS International's one. You'll see the link in the uh, chat box near the top, near the top, and they can watch it. But they won't be able to see the chat and they won't be able to see the Q&As. So you're completely anonymous. It's just us who can be heard or seen that are in the room. Um, we're recording it so that more people can benefit from watching it, especially those who are asleep at the moment. So the recording won't feature the chat, won't feature the written Q&A, it'll just be those that are in the room. Um, if you do join us in using your microphone and you want that to be edited out, you want your privacy, just tell Antonia before seven days and we'll edit that out. Um, because your privacy is the most important thing. Okay, so that's the technical bits. Um, I think the only other thing to say is that we hope you really enjoy it and treat each other with the respect and uh, generosity that we try to embody at ISPS events. And we're really glad you're here. Have I forgotten any of the technical bits, Ludi? No? Brilliant. Um, if you have any technical issues or you can't see what you think you should be able to see, just um, 
type it to the panelists or to all panelists and attendees and we should be able to help you. Some people seem to not be able to see anything except Ludi. Hopefully you can see me at the moment, but if you're not seeing um, the panel as a whole, let us know and we'll try and sort it out. Antonia, hopefully you've got your um, Zoom on gallery functions so you can see the boxes of all the participants, the panelists, because that's what the public will be able to see. Okay, I guess we go to um, introducing the panel. So the, this first part, um, it's really exciting, I think, because we're going to attempt what is sometimes called a trialogue. We're benefiting from some amazing people. And we have someone with personal experience of what gets called psychosis, a family member, a professional. I'm imagining that like many of us here, they wear multiple hats. We don't just embody one voice, we have many, but that's one of the things that brings them today. And we're going to discuss their experiences of the pandemic and the COVID situation, and also just think about how it is for different people in different kind of positions. And is there anything at all that we might want to take from it? Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask those who aren't taking part, um, those of the ISPS crew that aren't taking part in this bit, if you could just deactivate your camera, because it'd be really nice for me just to see the, uh, the lovely panelists. Um, so yeah, just turn off your camera if you're not taking part in this next bit, and that would be really helpful for us to kind of keep this, this vibe. Okay. Just got Marguerite to go. Um, we love you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, just, it's like it's just us four again um welcome guys i'd love it if we could just go around and introduce ourselves just briefly so people know a little bit about you and and why you're here um who'd like to go first well my name is barry floy and I have lived experience and I've been working in the field for like 20 years. I now work as a peer specialist at ICL. I have a caseload of clients and I deal with them on a regular basis. And that's Brilliant. about it. It's lovely to have you here. Again, like me, you yes. have lots of different identities. <laughs> <laughs> um, who else? Well, my name is uh, Bert Staven uh, I'm from the Netherlands, and I'm the director of uh, Mind Ypsilon, uh, who unites uh, about four or five thousand uh, family members uh, of people um, uh, living with psychosis. Okay, uh, I am Doug Söderström. I'm working in Switzerland as a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst. And uh, I've been directing a, um, a psychiatric uh, um, organization for a region in Switzerland for a couple of years. Uh, and now I'm working in private practice and, and uh, writing and, and uh, uh, doing what I, what I can for ISPS. Wonderful, thank you. I know it's a bit strange for us to be trying to have a trialogue via Zoom, but it feels like we're all in a very strange and slightly unnerving world right now. Um, the way this is going to work is we've got three sort of sections um, that Ludi asked us to talk to. And the first one is just thinking about your own experiences since um, the pandemic took off and we, we went into lockdown. I'd just like to ask you to go back to when this first started and, and how was it for you um, in your own lives and in your, in your own context? Anyone fancy starting? Well, I, I can't start and, and because the, I was uh, struck with, for the first uh, when when I had the client saying to me, uh, "Now you understand what uh, uh, it is for me uh, all the time." 
when there, we met isolation, we, we had all this, we have all this anxiety about, about death and death for ourselves, for our family. And also this um, paranoia in relation. Uh, we, we, we meet a friend, but maybe it could be something hurtful from this meeting. And um, also for me, what I think it was so difficult to, to see all the social ties like fragmented and, uh, and no, the, not the, the usual connection, uh, just to feel that, uh, well, <laughs> I am alive. And, and uh, uh, so um, it was, um, and it was, it is. I think uh, we have to understand that, that it's a traumatic time and it's going to, to, uh, to be a, a long time to, um, traumatic. So we need to, to face this uh, trauma together. So for you, it was very um, traumatic and a real difference in that, that human connection. Well, I think that, um, yes, I'm living on human connection. So uh, <laughs> when suddenly it stops and, but then we try to make some new, new ways of, of, uh, of connecting. But uh, I think that for, for, for the, the, with the, well, the axis of psychosis, non-psychosis, I felt that it was a kind of a bridge also that uh, we could have something about same feelings or that's what some of my clients say, say to me that, or maybe you understand something more uh, when through this uh, uh, traumatic times. Mm. Yeah, so in terms of how it's affected you, it's that sense, there's a bit of a sense that for some people you might have a greater insight into, into what life might be like sometimes. Yes, um, I'm very interested in, in hearing what uh, Barry and, and Bert have to say also about this uh, first uh, meeting with uh, the virus and, and the fear and, and uh, how, how they, they met that for the, at, the big, at the beginning. Well, for me, the, the beginning, at first it was, I had like a nonchalant attitude towards everything. I didn't think it was that bad. And then my doctor took me out of work because I have underlying health conditions. And so I said, this is serious. I didn't go, I, I was out of work for like 11 weeks. And I just went back during the second. But the hardest thing for me was I couldn't go to my groups anymore. I was, I was, I was isolating. I can only speak to my clients by phone. I couldn't meet with them face to face. And I attend voice hearing groups, so it's kind of like my voices begin to come out a little bit more. They begin to talk to me and say, Barry, this is your fault. Why did you do this? I had to deal with that. I knew it wasn't my fault, but that's how my voices, they kind of condescending, nasty towards me sometimes. But it was pretty rough. I gravitated towards my community, though. I went, I went outside of my community and started talking to people out there. It was kind of difficult because it's like we had nothing in common. They wasn't health professionals. And all they did was complain all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of pretty really hard, but I, I was able to deal with them. Mm. And so far, I'm doing pretty good with my voices has subsided. Mm -hmm. I know it's not my fault now. I'm doing pretty good, but I do miss going to Fountain House, but that was my outlet, a clubhouse. I used to go to a regular basis. And it was a community of about 400 people. I didn't have that community anymore. And that was complicated also. I had to deal with that. How do you live by yourself and being by yourself? But I was able to get in touch with myself, basically. It's like uh, I get closer to myself. I got to learn a little bit more about myself during this pandemic isolation. Yeah. It was pretty good though. It was, it was, some was hard. I discovered that um, I have a lack of days of attitude when it comes to things. Like I have so many projects I want to start. And I don't know where to start, start them at. And so I'm working, at, I'm working on that now with my psychologist. So everything is in pretty much good order now. Mm. 
Thanks, Barry. Mm. I wonder, is there anything, Bert, that you can relate to in that, or is it different? Yes, of course. Uh, well, uh, when when I heard of the lockdown in uh, in the Netherlands, um, I started, well, I presume, in, in a kind of helping mode. Um, I thought in this time of uh, isolation, uh, we need uh, we need contact, uh, we need information, we need uh, to share experiences. So um, we tried to uh, to connect to uh, uh, people, um, family members together uh, to talk uh, what's going on and uh, how how do you uh, react? Uh, and for me, um, uh, the. the, the <laughs> my experience changed uh, during uh, the pandemic. Um, at first I was afraid uh, that people uh, with psychosis uh, would be overwhelmed uh, by uh, COVID-19. Uh, and of course uh, some of them did, uh, but others stayed strong and uh, did it uh, in fact better than before. Uh, and that's, uh, well, uh, I was surprised uh, in, in a, a positive way. And how about family members like yourself or, or those that are in your circles? Uh, most family members, um, well, uh, it, it came in stages, I think. Uh, it, uh, at, at first, no one did, um, knew what, what, uh, what was going on and how to react. Uh, and after some time, some people... Um, became also in the state of, of, of help, a helping mode, uh, but others um, uh, uh, withdraw uh, to their own situation and, and um, uh, with their own, uh, uh, well, well, their own relative uh, and, and waited. Uh, I think most, uh, most of the relatives uh, were just uh, waiting, uh, wait and see what's going on. Uh, and it uh, made them kind of relaxed. Uh, and um, they saw, um, the, mostly I think they saw the, the, the positive, um, the positive ef effect of this uh, COVID-19. Mm. Positive in, in, um, in the way of they, um, uh, well, they were quiet. All of them, uh, the, uh, all of all, all of the, the family members, uh, including uh, the one uh, who, who uh, suffered from uh, from uh, psychosis, um, was was quiet and um, uh, um, uh, from be, from from uh, from um, uh, from the neighborhood. Um, there was more help than uh, on uh, at, at any other times. Um, I spoke to, to uh, a mother who said, uh, well, uh, my, uh, my daughter uh, has been called by uh, her niece uh, several times a week. Uh, and her nephew uh, played uh, uh, games online with her. And they never do it. Uh, they do it because, uh, because of the stage we are in uh, and because of they have the time to do it. So there's been a real shifting in, in the way people are engaging with each other. I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it really has, yeah. Because you know, I, went, yeah. I went back to work, it was, like, it was kind of like uncomfortable because sometimes I cough and people got so paranoid because I was coughing, said, who's coughing and stuff like that. They made sure they maintained six feet away from me. And it's like, it was, it was horrible to be honest with you. <laughs> Like I was playing with something out there at the job or something, but they were good though. It's funny though, there's this sense I've had myself and I, I experience, um, instead of being afraid of others, the way that my, um, the thing that gets called psychosis manifests for me is that I worry that I'm going to infect and harm others. So I remember going out and not wanting to breathe. And it really started to make me uh, a little cautious about being with people. Mm -hmm. when that's my work and that's my life these these in-person connections and Barry it sounds like for you as a peer 
specialist, that kind of being with people, it's very much your, yeah. your territory. But it's, um, yeah, it can be quite uncomfortable at the moment. I don't know if anyone relates to that or if there's something different going on for you guys. I think that has been a, a dynamic also in the, in the, well, going through to when the, was the lockdown, it was kind of less social pressure. Uh, but, but then I, I was just eager to, to have this connection. So I tried to find a way to connect with, with friends, but also with my clients, uh, with the different uh, way to, to, to connect but just not to stay paralyzed and unstuck because I felt that this was uh, the way of the anxiety uh, uh, a little everywhere. So, so uh, we, we got uh, uh, the kind of feeling uh, paralyzed. But then the, the relationship, I think we're, we're kind of stronger and, and uh, more, uh, more close and, and uh, something uh, feeling this uh, brotherhood uh, and uh, w w once we, we get uh, connected and I think it's uh, this is uh, very uh, important but what Barry said then reopening uh, for my clients uh, I think it's the most difficult time mm -hmm. uh, um, we don't really know how to um, to to react with the social distance we don't exactly know what is safe and what is not safe. Uh, so it's very, um, there is no uh, feeling of security in, in the, when you, you meet. So, so this is very strange. And I think it's difficult to put in, in words uh, because we, we are still in the, in the, in the traumatic times. So, so it's um, still g going on, but um, this social distance, uh, um, well, I think it's it's uh, it's very difficult to to manage. In, in addition, uh, um, uh, th this question of uh, what what uh, uh, what way we we uh, should act um, was in the beginning here in Holland uh, quite uh, frustrating uh, for all of us, uh, but especially uh, for the people in the institutions. Uh, because they uh, they saw uh, people with masks, etc., uh, very uh, traumatizing. I think. I think. Uh, and um, the the, uh, the the family members uh, couldn't visit them, and that that was a, a real problem because um, uh, um, in one day uh, all the institutions were shut down, and. Uh, we thought this is not the way uh, you should uh, respond uh, to, to a crisis like this. Uh, and we, we started a, a crowdfunding action uh, to, to, um, to uh, arrange some uh, called uh, quarantainers. So uh, containers uh, where you can visit uh, your, your, your body. Uh, uh, and and uh, it worked. Uh, we we, we uh, raised uh, more than uh, twenty five thousand uh, uh, guilders uh, euros. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and uh, now on, on uh, four uh, places in in Holland, there is uh, a possibility uh, to visit uh, your own uh, well, uh, the one you you uh, you beloved. It's like during the pandemic, about a month ago, they closed the subways at 1 a.m. So you had a lot of homeless people. They had nowhere to go because they were sleeping on the trains and everything like that. It was undiagnosed. That became very complicated. And some of them were put into shelters with, with masks. And they, like, they felt they may get sick and things like that. And it became very difficult for them because it was taken from their home off the train. It was trying to be put into institutions. They didn't want to go in Africa. They didn't want to go there at all because they fear the pandemic. So, so at, at one point, isolation is uh, maybe can you feel less pressure and it's kind of better in a way. But then uh, the second uh, 
it comes to 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 loneliness and and uh, uh, it's right. so it's 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 growing uh, in time. So the the the, t the time is very important in this. Uh, um, pandemic. Also, if there is trust and communication with the, with somebody and with the the, the local uh, uh, government or, or authorities in a way, or if there is no trust and communication, um, because if if there is no trust and communication, then you 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 feel like disorganized, really, uh, and everybody not knowing what to do and what is good, what is not good, what could harm and what could not harm. So it, it has a very disorganizing effect if it's, it is no trust and communication with the, the, the government or, or the authorities. We felt that strong in Switzerland and we, we, we were lucky to have a, a, a good government for that time. Uh, I'm smiling as you say that because I'm thinking about one of the big challenges we have, I think, in England. Um, lots of English people might disagree with me and it'd be interesting to see what people think, but there's a lot of people with less trust in the government, um, especially around distance. How far should we be near or far? Should we wear masks or not? Yeah. And it, it I think it affects everyone, but I'm interested whether it affects those of us who uh, might experience psychosis in a different way, or whether this is just global. So now, how is it in, um, is it New York you're from, Barry? Yes. Yeah. And like I said, with this like car and like isolation, and because of my psychosis, it's like it, it became, at one point it did become overwhelming for me. Not because my thinking began to be distorted because of what was going on. It was, it was, it was such a busy world at this particular time. Because I went to the doctor and they said I had traces of the COVID. That was another reason I couldn't go back to work so I kept me out of work. But I wouldn't tell anybody about it. I kept it to myself. I'm just actually letting people know now about it. I just didn't say anything about it. I did tell my daughters, but they didn't hold it against me. I said we go by and visit them and wear masks and things like that. But the isolation was, it was actually debilitating sometimes at some point. But I worked myself through it. I, like I said, I feel much better about everything now. I'm wondering what you guys have noticed in um, the other ways of connecting with people because we've we've all been isolated to different degrees. Mm -hmm. um, but I think all of you have said that we've found other ways. So the phone, the community, um, the internet. Um, again, thinking about family members, professionals, those of us who get labeled with psychosis, how, what have you noticed about those different ways? How is it different to being in person? How, how useful has it been? Well, something well, new, something new came up for, for my, so some, for some of my clients, it was something new that uh, we didn't have, we haven't talked about before. So, um, and also sometimes a bridge between um, uh, there was one client saying, well, I had this family story that was uh, before the, the time that I had my hallucinations. And uh, for the first time, I, I understood that maybe it could be a link between this hallucination I have and my own personal story. So it, it's, it's sometimes something new and new, new links uh, uh, appeared. Um, but also it, it, it depended really, we had, to, uh, I think we have to adapt very to, 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 to different persons. Some uh, was good on the phone, but some it was on Skype or um, I had someone on writing and then he, he was writing and then I was phoning uh, him after he has uh, written. And um, it was uh, sometimes very, um, well, uh, new and very interesting. 
um, so the, the, there's a lot of creativity, I think we, 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 have, uh, we have found out. But there, there is nothing like, like to be in real life, you know? <laughs> Can I ask, because I'm, I'm interested, um, in those situations where something new has emerged, something new has come up on the phone or in the internet, do you have any sense of how that's possible? Is it to do with the space or random? <laughs> um, I, when you say something new, believe it or not, my dreams got very distorted at this particular time because there was so much ugliness in the pandemic going on. And my dreams were distorted. It would bring up my past about what I went through and how bad my life used to be. It's like I would go into this every night. I would go through this. I would wake up in such bad space every morning. I had to work myself through it to get into a better state of mind. And I, and I spoke to my psychologist about it. He said, because you see nothing but fear, anxiety, and anger, and hurt people. And plus, people were dying. And that's the reason my dreams became so distorted because of everything. That's actually, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, um, that sounds really familiar because there's something in this particular pandemic and lockdown that has led a lot of my experiences to up again. Yeah. It's almost like there's so much stuff in the world that relates to my life history and that is echoes of it played out on this hideous scale, not just the pandemic, but other things too. Right. And it makes sense that it, it's going to have an influence. Yeah. But, really but may, maybe we, we will understand. There is a question. Uh, sorry. No. I'm sorry. I see, I see there's a question. Uh, on the, uh, uh, the question is in terms of not trusting the government, media, etc., what is the relationship, if any, between psychosis and our attitudes to conspiracy theories about the virus? Is it a question uh, for Doug? Uh, I, I didn't understand really the question. Uh, Once again. Uh, you, you can see it yourself at, at Q and A. Should I repeat it? Yes. Well, yes, please. Yeah. In terms of not trusting the government, media, etc., what is the relationship, if any, between psychosis and our uh, attitudes to conspiracy theories about the virus? <laughs> Oh, well, I, th I think, I don't know if I have an answer, but when, when you're feeling the help, helpless, really, and, and uh, vulnerability, then uh, you, you, you try to find out what is, uh, what is the meaning of, out, of, out of it. And uh, you, you feel that, that you, you are vulnerable, so you feel that something can harm you. So that then you, 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 you build up or you, you go with the, the conspiracy theories or you are very willing to, to, um, to, to go with the conspiracy theories. But it depends if you have a, a, a government, a government uh, any the authority that you have really trust and communication, then you, you, you don't need this, uh, um, these theories because you can feel a, a kind of protection. Um, but if you don't have any protection, then you can, you, you think, well, something is going to happen and it's happening now and it is uh, something bad and, and, and evil and it will harm me. So I think it has to do with the, the feeling of vulnerability and, and helplessness. Yeah, in, in, in addition, uh, I like uh, what you say about film and reality, <laughs> because I think uh, uh, it's also something uh, family members uh, do feel uh, in this period. Uh, and and uh, I think they, uh, there is more connection uh, between all of us uh, because of that. Hmm. I'm just, I'm still going back to that kind of idea about um, psychosis and conspiracy theories, because I'm reading Mirabai's question and going, what does she mean? She might actually want to say more about what she means in the Q&A so we can understand her. But 
one of the things that came to me while you were speaking, both of you, was um, we call things conspiracy theories sometimes as a way of dismissing them. And we can call things psychosis as a way of saying they're not true. But as you were talking about the government, Doug, I was going, oh my God, it's actually sensible not to trust the government. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I was thinking about, yeah, not to trust the government. Conspiracy <laughs> theory, could this be true? Could this be happening? Is there really conspiracy going on at all? And this is the challenge, isn't it? Because the world, yeah. there's this great, um, survivor thing i don't know if you guys have seen it called mad covid and it's by survivors who were mad before the world went covid crazy um <laughs> because the whole world it's all shifting i think as you've all said and here we are um we've still got our categories of psychosis and conspiracy theories but it's uh yeah there's some blurry lines in all of that perhaps uh -huh. I would say that we we need this the the groups where where we have the trust and communication and um, but it's a it's a big problem if you see like the day hospitals have closed some of yeah, most of them yeah. and uh, so uh, where do you go to have this uh, small groups where you can find this. Um, um, well, that you can talk and, and say all these feelings about what is happening, what you have thought about the others and what you have thought about uh, what is going on. And, and um, so you, you can elaborate about all this, but you need a, a safe space to uh, elaborate what is, what is going on. And uh, until we don't have this, uh, it's very difficult, I think. And I didn't have that same space. It was complicated for me. I didn't have the groups I was running, going to my groups. I didn't have farmhouse to go to. And I really didn't have people to talk to about exactly what was going on. I don't even remember a psychologist like once a week. It's like I needed more than that. I need confirmation. I need more input, intel to tell me what's going on here. Wow. Yeah. And this um, Elizabeth has written something, a question. We'll leave the questions mostly till um, the last part, but there's something that she said that I'd like to bring in, which is uh, during lockdown, it became clear that one of the most profound differences between people was how safe their home was. And so not only were things like hearing voices groups and the clubhouse and, and the appointments with people and the family relations, um, like, lost the physical part anyway but for some people the home is not a sanctuary yeah. have you guys got anything to say around that that you've noticed or, or think my home wasn't my sanctuary it really was i was going in and out the apartment like seven or eight times a day i just yeah. couldn't stand my apartment at all i just couldn't take it because when i stayed there my mind began to wander began to just like take his own form I find it very difficult to stay in the apartment. I would go outside, come back, and I did this at least eight times a day. And I still do it when I'm off for work. I still do the same thing. I just can't sit in my apartment. Cause it's like, I have like an evening apartment. I can come to my apartment after seven o'clock. I don't have a daytime apartment, if that makes any sense. It's not the type of apartment you want to be in the daytime. It's for the evening to see that when the world is kind of like calm down and relax at this particular time. And I said, come, I have a even in an apartment, not a daytime apartment. Yeah, and that's huge actually. Um, almost, it reminds me of being in a hospital where I don't really want to stay in my room or my bed space, um, yeah. but I'm not allowed to go back in. You know, I can't really go anywhere and it's just, yeah, really similar. Well, that, that's that's really problem of the safe the safe space and and uh, it depends a lot of what is built before the pandemic, and if you had found this safe space before, uh, then it's well uh, with family or or sometimes just with yourself. Um, it's a, but sometimes it is not with oneself. Um, um, so it's it's a kind of the pandemic is uh, is uh, revealing 
if you have uh, found that safe space before or not, and uh, uh, Barry said something about ho homeless people and uh, that uh, the social issues are very uh, important because suddenly you, you, um, you are uh, cut off everything, uh, not only uh, the therapist, but your home and, and, and exactly. uh, everything is, is uh, become hostile. Um, and um, I think this is important for, for us, everybody as a community, also uh, lived experience, family members, professional, that uh, what do we do with that kind of problems? Uh, with the social issues, I mean. Um, I was uh, looking to, through some, some uh, stories I heard. Wow. <laughs> uh, and I uh, uh, remembered uh, one of the, the uh, uh, homeless people uh, here in my, my, uh, my place um, who uh, left the shelter. Uh, because uh, he thought, he felt it, it, it wasn't safe anymore. Uh, and he um, uh, went to the wood uh, and uh, lived there for, well, maybe two months, uh, because it was the only place, uh, place uh, where he thought uh, he was safe. Um, and uh, other people... Um, had their, their safe place uh, on recovery centers, uh, but they were closed. So they, they had nothing left uh, and stayed at home. And for some, uh, it, it uh, worked uh, well out uh, and they, they, they um, uh, became, um, well, maybe better uh, um, uh, than before. Uh, and some uh, I know uh, uh, there were there were family members uh, visiting uh, all the time uh, to bring food, etc. Uh, but uh, it it, uh, it became too huge. To, it was it was um, they were not able to 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 uh, to help themselves uh, and had to go uh, to the hospital. Mm -hmm. I've I've seen it all. I've heard it all. Yeah. And someone was interested, I think Elizabeth, in, in people's experience of either being in hospital during the pandemic or working in a hospital or, or that kind of closed environment. I don't know if any of you have experience or have friends or allies that have talked with you about their experiences. No. <laughs> Ooh, we I, don't hear you, uh, Doug. I have friends working at the hospital during that time. Um, it was uh, it, it was the first. It was confusion uh, everywhere, not knowing how to 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 say. But this is interesting about uh, labeling and psychosis. Uh, labeling, saying uh, who has who has the virus and who has not the virus. And the confusion, confusion time between, oh, do you have it or do you, don't you have it? So um, then when it became organized, then it was kind of uh, easier for everybody to, to know what was his work. Uh, but um, I think it, it's uh, the, the, the main part was about uh, uh, treating the, the people that have the, the worst uh, uh, part of the virus. And uh, everybody was um, uh, fo focused on treating uh, the patient that have the, the pneumonia. And, and um, so, so uh, the people were working in that team, they felt oh, yeah, we are at the right, right place for today. Mm -hmm. um, and they also felt that support from the, um, the society to, to their, their work, so it was not that bad. 
um, I've heard some stories uh, of uh, people um, who stayed in, in a hospital uh, and the, the, the COVID-19 uh, became part of their uh, psychosis. Uh, it, was, it was really uh, scary. Um, but I've also heard in, in Holland there was one hotspot uh, where COVID uh, ex exploded. Uh, and uh, I've heard several stories about uh, people who, uh, who were admitted uh, over there. Uh, and of course, uh, saw people die. Uh, uh, um, and uh, the stories were about, uh, about recovery, uh, about uh, talking uh, like anyone else uh, who lost uh, a friend or, or, or a beloved one uh, within, uh, within the hospital. Uh, so it, it became very close, uh, they became uh, very close to each other. Huge thing to go through together. Mm. Barry, um, are any of uh, the people you support, um, have any of them had any experience of hospitalisation that it's okay to share what it was like for them during the pandemic or...? Oh, you might need your microphone uh, unmuting. Let's see. Okay. There we go. I spoke to like 15 of them. Number one, they, none of them have been into the hospital. They've been keeping safe distance. They've been staying at home. A lot of them are isolating. They feel, a lot of them feel safe in their home and they haven't been going out. And so they don't need to go to the hospital. They have virtual meetings with their doctors on the phone um, through chat lines and everything. They do this on a regular basis. And all of them appear to be doing quite well. They're doing, they're doing pretty good though. That brings us to the final part of us chatting together before we open the doors to even more questions, um, which is, it's so easy to get hung up, well, not hung up, it's so easy to focus on what we've lost and are losing. And that needs to be really heard and honored because this has not been a good time for so many. In fact, for some, both with, uh, experience of psychosis, family members, workers, and humans, it's been a hideous time. But like you said, some people are doing all right. And there, there are bits of creativity that are happening that we might want to hang on to as we move into whatever the next phase is. Yeah. Is there anything that you guys want to keep or that you've learned through this process that you want to kind of hang on to as we move forwards? Um, my creativity came out. I discovered I had to do something with myself as opposed to just like doing nothing. So I was going to house after six o'clock. I just tried to be more creative with myself about how do, we, how do I start my next workshop? How do I do a picture or essay with people with mental illness and things like that? And so I began to keep myself very busy after six or seven o'clock, not in the daytime. <laughs> I love that creativity has been a thing for you. I feel like I've lost mine. And I've been focused far too much on trying to help the universe. And okay. it's forcing me to actually stop doing that now because it, it's been a long time and I need to get back to finding a bit more about myself again and to keep myself healthy. So I love that you've already been there. <laughs> you've got okay. that. I need to learn from you a bit there, I think, Barry. Well, I would also say the creativity in the way of connecting. Uh, but also that uh, there is the, the um, between psychosis and non-psychosis, that it's so easy to go from one step, to, from one uh, place to another, um, that really um, to go uh, paranoid and, and uh, to to, um, well, if somebody now is, say to anybody, well, I just he hear something about uh, 
uh, God saying something to me and about life and death. Well, what 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 is it? It's it is a delusion, or it, I mean, it's we are going uh, step further. I think about diagnosis and understanding that this is uh, really a human. Uh, that in extreme situation we we all are uh, pretty much the same and uh, this is I think very important if we can understand or keep that for for the um, for the future uh, for for myself I think that the the, the missing the the group and missing the the the, the body uh, connection I think uh, Really understood how much it is difficult for me to not to <laughs> to to hug my daughter or you know um, for a time and and um, uh, this uh, sensitivity about distance I think also to to understand that well how to keep that social distance which is very not human for me it's a kind of uh, something that well well we we are against um, what is uh, what is human so i think it's uh, well talk about this and try to make a, not to make a ptsd everybody <laughs> that's uh, would be my <laughs> what i would uh, suggest for the future well i can't say better uh, so <laughs> But uh, when you ask me, uh, do you have any practical lessons? Uh, then I have one, uh, maybe. Uh, I, I told you um, in the start of this pandemic, uh, there was a suddenly shutdown uh, of all, also of all the institutions. Uh, and uh, I learned that uh, uh, isolation is not the only solution. Um, life is more than not going to die. Uh, and uh, people in institutions uh, should be able to see their beloved ones. And it's possible. It's possible. Just be creative. I love that you made that happen as well, your organization. Um, that's fantastic to hear. I think one of the things that has come up for me is it's really given me a kick up the backside. Does that translate in different languages? <laughs> <laughs> to remember that so many people who have voices or experience what gets called paranoia struggle to leave the home anyway and now we're all stuck <laughs> and so it's forced me in the Hearing Voices Network to do more things, make booklets, send them out, um, do some fundraising so we can actually reach out to people on Zoom and uh, do webinars and events. And I think I'm gonna keep that because when we go back to being in person, there'll be some people that won't join us or won't want to join us. And actually I've a responsibility to kind of keep them in mind. But then it leaves me with that really tricky one of the people that are not on Zoom on the phone and not in person how I reconnect with those people in my networks who are completely isolated at the moment and how do we rebuild something that feels okay um don't know if you guys have any ideas about that or if it's just a an ongoing question uh, we have some teams where a uh, uh, nurse go to to see people at home um, and I think this is the, the best thing because some some people they they have not only isolated but they have uh, really uh, become very lonely and 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 sad and depressed also. Uh, so you need to have somebody to go to to home and knock at the door and and say hello. So you just can't leave people just like that. So so. Um, I don't know if it's just in uh, all the countries, but uh, um, these teams are very, very important. Um, I, I, I agree on that. Um, uh, here in Holland, there was a discussion because uh, uh, all, all visits at home uh, were, were uh, stopped and been stopped. And uh, because we have uh, that uh, kind of teams as well. 
um, and um, they started with uh, video conferences uh, and uh, thought it was the only solution uh, to meet uh, people, to connect uh, with people. Uh, and we have said from the start, well, maybe, maybe it's a possibility. Maybe some people like it, uh, but other people uh, won't. Uh, and they need contact as well. Uh, and uh, well, it took three months uh, to, to, to make it happen. And, and, uh, and that was too long, too long, very long. Yeah. I'm in this position where I'm thinking, hmm, I wanted to get to the questions, <laughs> so find out what people want to know. Yeah. Um, I'm also thinking that some people may want to say a few words. Mm -hmm. um, I need Antonia to make me a co-host if we're going to do that, because when I had to log out, I came back as just a regular panelist. So hopefully Antonia is listening. Yes, she is still there. Brilliant. Um, I have the power. So let's have a look at some of the questions that we've got already. And hopefully we'll have time just for a few little voices. We've got about eight, 15 minutes for this. Um, that one. From Janice, this is an interesting one. She says, or he says, it seems to be a time of changing moods and not knowing what's going to come up and when. How do the panel deal with this? Changing moods, you say it was a time of change, and it was a big time for change. And your mood began to alter also. It's, it's kind of like going with the flow of everything, like you're being comfortable within yourself and just move through the situation, basically. I think that's what you have to do. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, I, w I would say something about uh, still about time and 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 uh, and inner narrative that um, the the changing moods uh, it depends so much about what has happened before. So um, if you, you we, we all need to have somebody to help us to to construct um, um, a thread, something that is. Uh, uh, going from a, a time to another time, what has happened before, and maybe to understand that, well, I'm, I'm there because this has happened just before. And uh, so it helps to know so where we are going. Now, the problem what we are going as, a, as um, uh, with the virus is, uh, is to, to, uh, to deal with the uncertainty uh, that we, we have. And, also that we are we have we, we are always thinking that death will not be in 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 our place in our family in, and and suddenly it's there and it's there for a long time so so um um well <laughs> uh, we, we will change moods also for we will have different moods coming also um mm -hmm. And it depends also what is happening in different countries. I think it's it's not you cannot say that for one country so different from different countries. Anything you want to add to that, Bert? Uh, well, I talked about uh, the, the 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 quiet society, the the uh, the, the slow society, uh, and and. For me, pers personal, but but uh, I see it uh, also in my environment. Um, yes, there is an uncertainty. Uh, we don't know uh, what's going on and and uh, uh, what we will have to to uh, see, etc. But um, it helps when you slow down. Uh, we see it all, uh, and it. Uh, I think that's uh, also a lesson of this pandemic. Uh, a bit slower helps us all. Thank you. I was thinking, um, for me, what's helped me most, as well as my um, so-called psychosis coming up during this time, I think it's my experience of psychosis and hospitalization that's helped. 
because it's always been shifting for me. There's always been different realities, <laughs> you know, um, and things I've had to deal with. So a global pandemic just feels like another one of my beliefs um, in a way, because that was my reality. I've had alien conspiracies. I've had a lot. This is another one. Um, and all of them have been terrifying, <laughs> which is a, a strange, strange thing. Um, uh, let's have a little look. So we've got Edo, who said, as an experience expert, I tried to help people to believe less in their psychiatric diagnoses and help them to believe more in themselves. This seems impossible now because you are to believe in the government without questioning. And if you don't, you're a suspect. So I, I think if I'm right, what sounds to me that what you're asking is, we're asking people to not trust the authorities that tell you that you're schizophrenic or you're, that you're borderline, believe in yourself. And now in a situation where we're all, we, we're told to look to the government and do what they say in very concrete ways. And um, how does this match with this sense of believing your own instincts? Any thoughts? <laughs> That's a biggie, right? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> not not an easy not an easy one. This one, <laughs> um, I think we with the with the governments we 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 see how we we see how is things are going on. I mean, we are not stupid. We we see what is happening uh, outside. We see um, uh, so so. The trust is 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 not something that you built and rebuilt all the time. Uh, so uh, uh, you you just uh, open your eyes and look out and talk with people and you see if uh, uh, the government is saying something that is uh, reliable or or not. Um, that's that's not only believe in oneself. It's also also going out and see what was, uh, look at look at the word and. Uh, uh, see if you can trust what the what the government says. A bit like dealing with voices, really. You're like, <laughs> okay, so that's what they're saying. Do I believe it? Do I not? Um, except you can get arrested if you don't do what the government say sometimes. <laughs> exactly, because the government kind of manipulates us a lot of time into believing what, what he wants us to believe. And when he mentioned about the diagnosis, it's like to try to get people to be there. Because you're not the diagnosis, number one. You are an individual. You're mm. a separate entity from the diagnosis. It's like, that's how I thrive on being that. I am not my dad. I am not my illness. And I try to live my life that way, no matter what the doctors may have told me I was bipolar schizophrenic. I just don't believe it. Mm. I'm just a voice here. <laughs> yes. You're awesome. But yeah. It's. There's something, isn't it? For me, what's helped is this idea of community. I wear a mask when I go out because of other people and my caring for other people. It's a symbol of showing that I care. And yeah, that questioning I do for my voices and the diagnoses I do with the government. But yeah, I don't know. It's something about it not just being, I'm following the government blindly. I'm going actually, even for people's morale, if I wear the mask, even if I don't believe the government, I still want to help people feel comfortable with me. You know, so maybe it's just how we think about this following of the government and keep that critical mind, as you say, Doug. Mm. Okay. There, are, we... there are any more questions? Yeah, that's what I was going to suggest. We've got a few discussion points. Uh, one, very briefly, is that's a big discussion point is from Edith and just to summarize it I think they're just wanting to say that um, we know very little about this virus still and but what we do know is that people are affected differently so people from um, South Asian origin in the UK um, black people much more likely to die in hospital than white people. There's a lot of inequalities. It's and three times as much that blacks are dying more than whites. Yeah. And also the social, because um, they point out that 
often the big wigs look at the, the uh, genetic factors and maybe miss the social factors. So even a tradition of taking food to your loved one is a way of healing them and the community that gathers around you when you're very sick, that's been completely stopped now if someone's in hospital with COVID so that that might have an impact as well, which I'd not thought about. So yeah, thank you, Edith. But, but I think this is very important. Also, what Bert said said uh, for, that uh, we we need to make the organization understand that the family needs to, to they need to meet and to find ways. And this is also as important as treatment, uh, as uh, um, uh, well the, the 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 medical, more biological part of of uh, of treatment. So. Uh, the connecting with with family uh, because it, it has been a, a very important problem that that uh, one could say well I'm sorry but um, you 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 can't beat it, and this is not is not true you you have to find other ways but uh, um, the, the, the to 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 make the the, the also, the medical organization understand that this is uh, uh, so important to so that people get better, um, both physically and, and uh, psychologically. We are all one one person. So, so um, this is also something that we can think uh, uh, do together, um, uh, lived experience, family members, and professional to say, well, hey, uh, you, you can't do that anymore. Uh, we will not let this uh, to be done uh, once again. Yeah. In that way, this, this the pandemic is also, I think, um, normalizing the, 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 the relationship between uh, the one uh, who has uh, the psychotic experience and the one who has not, uh, because you need each other. I want to ask more about that, but then I'm also looking at the big list of questions that are wonderful and that are growing. So I'm going to hold my, my curiosity um, for now, at least, maybe later. Um, we've got a question from Lane asking, um, when denial kicks in as a defense against the painful realizations of the facts about COVID-19, is it easier to get drawn into psychosis? It's a way of just escaping from what's going on out there. What do you think? I want to deny about the pandemic. I really did. I just didn't believe what's going on. It's like, I felt it was impossible in this day and age for something like this to happen. It did give me each way with my psychosis. It's like, it actually relaxed me because I was in denial. It's like, nothing's going to bother me, nothing's going to fear me, nothing's going to hurt me because I didn't believe that's what's really going on with the pandemic. Right. And that kept me in denial for a while. Until um, I spoke with my doctors and stuff like that. Um, I, I think that people with lived experience, they are not in denial so much than others. <laughs> because they, uh, they, well, they have, they, they, um, well, they have had anxiety about death and 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 uh, all this. Um, what 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 will happen and feelings of of uh, vulnerability. So um, uh, denial. It's it's more something that has happened to uh, people that have not been through psychosis and is uh, the 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 denial. It's more uh, something that is more common. Um, uh, because uh, the denial is, ab is about the death anxieties, I think, uh, mostly. Um, and uh, then it's denial, and, and it's not only denial, it's and then try to, to, to find some kind to project and say, well, it must be some, someone's fault. And um, then we are in very uh, dangerous issues uh, um, to find out that there's this kind of other population or comes from some somewhere or um, 
So, um, well, denial is more a problem if, if some governments are in denial than, than ordinary people or people with psychosis. <laughs> and we've got only three minutes left. So I'm going to ask you a quick fire question for each of you. And this was um, asked by Lee. And I think it's a stormer of a question. Given that we've said that this COVID situation has given everyone a taste of this fear, this isolation that those of us with psychosis experience might go through sometimes. How do you think we can build on that awareness within the community to um, develop better responses to people who are more vulnerable because of their experience of psychosis? Like what practical might we, how might we build on this? Big question. Well, in, in my opinions, when I start, um, I think uh, the, the people with uh, lived experience uh, can be a teacher to uh, the other ones. Uh, they, they know um, uh, better than uh, anyone else how it is to be in that kind of situation uh, and know uh, how to deal with it uh, and, and uh, know they can... Um, uh, they can uh, become better uh, than they were before. I think the education is most important. You have to educate the people about what's going on and what and what you birthed and they never experienced, and just talk to them about it. I think that make it better place and make it better for everyone. Education is the key. Um, well. I think also like something like ch ch this evening uh, is um, is helping a lot for for everybody that uh, um, uh, well it's it's really le learning from experience and uh, uh, that we, we 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 are we will still learn so much about what what is happening so. Um, I think I don't have the answer right now <laughs> of, of, about that question, but uh, uh, learning, learning, learning. And I'd probably making those links explicit because whilst we know the links are there because we're all in this field together, I think if I spoke to my friends who don't understand this stuff, they would know that there's only link between their experiences and what gets called psychosis, events that raise awareness, awesome. I'd love to thank everybody that's asked a question. There's still a front answered. Some we answered through the thing, but I'd suggest if you're listening, um, you can also answer questions just by typing an answer so people can get different ideas about them. And you guys as panelists, if you want to see the questions, you can give your perspectives too. Um, one person, Catherine, has asked if we can do something creative today. Uh, or she has a story she could tell. That's up to Ludi, who is doing, and Deborah, who are doing the nuts. That's out of my hands, I'm afraid, Catherine. And I want to thank, thank each and every one of you as panelists who have been fantastic and made my life a lot easier. It's been great talking with you. And if it's okay, uh, if we can our off now we can hope that whoever's doing the next part turns their cameras on otherwise it's going to be blank screen that's a subtle hint to the next one thanks very much guys thank and you. thank you for that and taking part Oh, thank you, Ray. Thank you, Dag. Thank you, Bert. And thank you, Barry. And thank for everybody who contributed. Um, it's now, um, my mind's still sort of processing all the information and all the questions and that that have been answered, asked and answered. So um, my mind's pretty full at the moment. So it seems like an ideal opportunity to pass over to Marguerite what ISPS did as an organisation was ask people to send in their own stories and their experience of, of, um, of what's been happening for them <clears throat> and the people that are significant to them and the people who work with them um, about dealing with the um, 
COVID-19 situation. So Marguerite has uh, very kindly um, gone through all these stories um, and summarised them in a way and is now going to present, I suppose, some of the common threads, the common denominators, um, the findings that have come from that. So I'm going to hand over to Marguerite to show us what she's come up with. And hopefully that will open up some discussion for everyone. Over to you, Marguerite. Okay, thank you. Uh, Antonia, can you show the PowerPoint? Ah, yeah. Um, okay, uh, first of all, uh, I did not uh, summarize the stories that with Cecily did, and then I went over it and and uh, so and I search for uh, other information. So so uh, it's uh, really a project of Cecily and me. I uh, next uh, next slide please. Um, there are twenty five stories in total, and uh, some are not translated yet, but they will appear on 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 uh, the website of the ISPS. And please go uh, look at the stories yourself because it, it, they were so different that it is very difficult to summarize them. So, so but we I, we we we, we uh, found some themes. What well, was well, were in common and yeah that's the first team uh well it's a very common one had uh, many people were uh excited had anxiety and uh, like other people in in in, uh, in the community and were uh, very helped by the the quiet uh surroundings and social connection i come to that uh, uh, next time next play next next slide please yeah the isolation proved not to be a big problem and that was because many people are used to this they have a lifestyle uh, of isolation often uh, but they feel uh, people feel less pressure and um, they found uh, time to reading books take a run baking and they were very glad that the surroundings were calmer okay uh, there was lots of creativity. Uh, there were uh, other ways of connecting via uh, uh, the, the, the internet, but also uh, new learning new skills and other and some therapists that quite a different sort of therapies. So I invite you to look at it. Next one. And there was a change in relationships. Uh, people felt that their uh, connection was deeper and uh, they could make contact with old friends. And because everybody has problems, so the connection is easier. Okay. Um, so there was more equality. And uh, so people, all the people are in, it, in this together. And there was less feelings of alienation. And... Um, what was very interesting to read was that uh, the people, uh, there was also equality, uh, equality on uh, uh, to know what is truth or what is not truth. So uh, when the situation is normal, uh, people have a consented reality and everyone who thinks otherwise uh, can have the diagnosis psychosis but now everyone is not is doesn't know what reality is there's lots of doubts and the people with uh, who had this uh, uh, paranoid before they are they, they can teach other people right next next one so and what was uh, very important was that people found they were stronger through uh, former uh, experiences. So some people said, I was anxious so many times before and I did not die. So I will not die this time. 
And another one, the person said that he had uh, very psychotic thoughts about uh, he uh, is guilty of uh, the COVID-19. But then he recalled former experiences and who were not true and, well, he could manage them. Uh, another person uh, saw to see the keys to loved ones and could, for the first time, grie grieving about the loneliness. And a very therapist uh, call, uh, said that patients were reassuring them because, well, they say we've been through such a lot of, uh, of, of, tr of trouble, so, so we can manage. Next one. And the uh, helpers were more creative too and flexible. And some were in crisis because some people uh, with psychosis got better. And then uh, the helper were in crisis because they, uh, lose, they lose their role. So, well, that's, uh, that's maybe Bertse can say something about that. What most important things were that uh, that uh, people mentioned that they were a caring person, there was uh, honesty and flexibility, and what was very important that caring for other people, yourself, is very important to survive. Yes. So, lock, uh, Corona was a lockdown, but also a liberation for many. And we go to the last slide. Um, I talked uh, with a lot of people in the Netherlands and a Dutch research institute sent uh, questionnaires and found that people with psychosis susceptibility uh, uh, did far better than other people. So, and uh, they are very curious why, why that is. And Mike, I will ask you to help them. What? Uh, Maybe we can do a kind of um, uh, uh, brainstorm, a digital brainstorm to why are people with lived experience do better than others. That was, that was it. Was it. Okay. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you for yeah. that. And I must say for myself, I, oh, sorry, I'll do that too. I must say for myself that actually I wasn't that surprised that um, people who had had um, lived experience dealt with it, um, that had the personal resources and resilience to be actually be able to to deal with the lockdown better than others. Because I, I think like you say, we're, um, we're used, our daily life is filled with fear and mistrust and isolation and discrimination and inequities. That's, that's our day-to-day -day life. So in some ways it was an extension of that. But what we were seeing, we were witnessing people around us having to um, deal with also with those sorts of situations. And we actually felt in a position to extend a helping hand, which made us in lots of ways, I think feel more connected to people. It also made us feel like we had a contribution to make. So I, I think that was actually a helpful component for us and, um, yeah, and probably was a, a major contributor into why we were able to come through. I'm not going to say unscathed because some of us most certainly didn't, but how a lot of us actually dealt with the situation. As I said, it was an extension for us of our lives. But I'd be really interested to hear from other members of the panel and from the audience about what their own um, experiences or, or their own thinking and thoughts are on why perhaps um, people with lived experience did seem to um, be able to deal with the COVID-19 situation better. Sorry. 
something that Jose has talked about is working with peers. A few of them suddenly had a kickstart in recovery and I felt the lockdown confronted everybody with themselves. For some, for some this was very positive, for others it was very difficult, especially for people with psychosis, it was positive. People with fears became much more afraid. I wonder if this is the experience of all of you too. And, and I'd also be interested too, because I think, Marguerite, you talked about the level of anxiety that seemed to be the overarching feeling was this level of high anxiety. So how um, how do people, the, the general public, I suppose, when they well, were people, to this extreme anxiety? Yeah, well, people, uh, some people had anxiety, but then it went over because, and of, of two things, because of the quiet surroundings and because of the uh, the good relationships which developed with other people. So one person uh, uh, talked about the neighbor and he doing um, uh, uh, shopping for the neighbor and things, simple things like that. So, uh, so many people did overcome their anxiety because of these two things. And of course, uh, through uh, former uh, experiences. Mm -hmm. Barry, did you have anything that you'd like to add to that from your own experience? Is there anybody from the panel who would also like to contribute? Can you repeat the question again? Um, I, I was just um, wondering about, we were talking about anxiety, the high levels of anxiety that were expressed amongst the general sort of population, as opposed to those of us who live with it as a daily event. <laughs> and, okay. Yeah. Well, I live with a daily event. It's like, I just learned how to cope with it. <clears throat> just go with the flow, actually. Because I was taught how to deal with my anxiety, how to overcome it. There's a, a, I must say, there's a comment here from Alan who says, those who have experienced psychosis and have accepted something of the fragmentation, this can bring perhaps do better. It is acceptance as opposed to denial that helps. And someone with little experience of fragmentation will perhaps more easily step into blocking out what is happening. Well, that's an, I think that's a really interesting um, observation. Dag, do you have any, um, any, any thoughts on this? This notion of um, some people who have not experienced, I suppose, A, that level of anxiety, but also that, that sense of fragmentation and not being part of the world. How that would how that contributes. Sorry, I, I have not followed the la, the last um, the last time. I was thinking that there was somebody who, who wanted to to intervene uh, uh, on um, on the um, on the chat. Okay. Sorry. I don't know if one of my other panelists can um, come through. I haven't. Sorry, it hasn't come through. I, I haven't got it at my end, etc. No one, no one, uh, Deborah, no one in, in the, who sent in a story uh, uh, mentioned fragmentation. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, so that's, that's not something that came. Um, but something that did come through in the stories was definitely the social isolation and the shift in terms of the social connection and what that means. And yeah. I think we have long um, 
been talking about the um, the emphasis and the importance of, of social connection and, and the social um, determinants of, of mental health. Yep. So once that that did seem to take a um, a prominent sort of position as such, and I was wondering, um, Margaret, in terms of the stories that you were hearing, at what level were people talking about in terms of social connection? Was <laughs> the um, the neighbors speaking to them or, or was it much much broader than that what I don't know if you can elaborate a little bit more on that from yes. the story that you've sometimes very sim simple things just neighbors uh, but also uh, connections they had were uh, were experiences deeper so with with family members with friends and uh, also uh, looking for uh, uh, old friends and uh, phone them. Uh, that kind of uh, connection were mentioned. Just uh, ordinarily simple, one, but it was deeper. I wonder if the conversations were different with people um, in terms of um, actually what what the um, what the COVID nineteen forced us to do in some way was actually inquire about people's well-being, inquire yep. about their health, inquire about what was going on for them. So maybe the conversations were different. So we didn't have the, we weren't having those sort of social superficiality as such, or or just though that very um, sort of hello, how are you, but not really mean it. Because when we said how are you, we really meant it. Yeah. This time. <laughs> So I, I wonder if there wasn't something also about the quality of the conversations that we were hearing and what I think um, particularly people with lived experience are well versed at is that we are particularly good at picking up authenticity. So when people required that what we also picked up on was people's genuine concern. Yes. And, and there's going to be a knock-on effect from that, isn't it? That, that that's going to enhance my my sense of self and my 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 sense of, of how I'm placed in the world. So, mm -hmm. even though on the surface it seems like a, a minor thing, in fact, the impact can be quite major. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and I um, I think you're right. Uh, I, I was thinking about uh, an, an example uh, of small things um, with a big meaning. Um, uh, there were in Holland. There were um, uh, during during this uh, pandemic. Uh, well, I think uh, every month a press conference, or or every week, or two weeks, or mm -hmm. something like that. The press conference. Um, uh, from the Prime Minister, uh, mainly, uh, who said uh, something about uh, what's going on uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, and um, they were, he was always talking about the, the elder people uh, in institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you can agree this. Uh, it, it, I think it's not only in Holland uh, that, that uh, this appeared, uh, that this happened. Um, uh, and I think it was the fifth press conference uh, when for the first time uh, the Prime Minister mentioned uh, people in mental hospitals for the first time. Uh, uh, so the, the fifth uh, press conference and for the first time he mentioned uh, mental hospitals. Uh, and there uh, was a daughter uh, not uh, uh, inpatient. Uh, she was sitting to, uh, next to her mother and she says, he's talking about me. He's talking about me. I exist. I yeah. exist. Yeah. Gosh. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's powerful stuff. I'm sorry? I'm sorry? So please continue, Bert. Sorry. No, no, no. I, I, I was finished. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, th I think, you know, well, may maybe, uh, um, uh, I think um, every one of us uh, needs to be seen. Uh, and um, 
this is a, a, a small example of, of being seen. Uh, and, and I think it's important uh, to, to, uh, to know um, uh, that we see each other. And, and uh, in that, uh, um, uh, we, we see in, in house um, uh, family members, uh, people uh, uh, with uh, uh, experience of uh, psychosis, etc. Uh, and I think we see each other more um, uh, more than other times, uh, not in uh, frequency, but but we see each other more. Mm. I think it's really it, about, oh sorry, Cecile, please go. Oh, ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just uh, thinking about the this um, uh, uh, different kind of relationships, and and I remember Barry. He said that he felt also closer to himself you know mm. it, we feel mm. closer to each other to our, uh, our relationships becomes uh, mm. deeper but also with ourselves and I think that's quite uh, you know it's interesting to hear and I, I can relate to that a lot but I was just also looking at the Q&A's and I saw this um, uh, th this thing from David uh, who works in an uh, inpatient unit and can I just read it? Because I thought it was please, nice. And, please do, yeah. Yeah. Our inpatient units have been halved in size. There is noticeable, noticeable shift in relationships on the wards as they are isolated from family and the outside world in general. Many of the staff are isolated too. We had high levels of infections in staff, uh, in staff me included. And this has created a shift in dialogue content in content and initiators. Uh, a decentering of practice as I think we are drawn to our humanness and owing holding of fear, uh, owning holding of fears of the seemingly inexplicit, uh, inexplicable together. I think that's, that's a nice, um, I know, um, way of putting it. And I think it's, yeah, I nice can relate to it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very beautiful. Yeah. I, I that's what we saw with the emphasis our value system came to the fore. Uh, uh, we saw an emphasis much more on people, but much more on relationships. And we saw also that family is not necessarily blood related. Families can be chosen as well. So we can invite people in and our relationship with them can be as strong, as powerful as if we were related by blood. Mm. And, um, so I, I think there's been a real, um, I know Ludi talked in the beginning about this being an existential experience. And I think for a lot of people it has been, it's almost been realigning with the world. So there is, there is a learning, definitely we've talked about, but there is a real learning that's come from this. And I know um, in the South Pacific here where I'm from, we, um, have been very fortunate to not have been as um, affected by, by the COVID virus as in other places. But what it's make, made us very aware of is our need to um, connect to each other, which is, which is part of our culture, I think, um, intrinsically anyway, but also how there is a global community out there so this is an opportunity um, rather to isolate, but a chance to reach out to people. Can I add something to it, uh, Deborah? Oh, please do, Marguerite. Yeah, thanks. Well, there is also a change in roles. You are not, uh, and people are not the patient anymore and the other ones are not <laughs> normals anymore. So you're all in, <laughs> You are all in the same troubles, <laughs> so so you're more equal. Yeah, and in some way, we're, we're uh, the, those of us who are experienced are, are sort of better equipped to deal with that. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So we 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 have shared the skills that we have developed. Yeah. Often over long periods of time, we've been able to share those skills. Yeah, absolutely. Which, some ways has validated is quite validating for our own experiences mm -hmm. um, 
it can make sense of so I can now draw on that to help others yeah something incredibly rewarding in that it's it's I think what it helped to diminish would be my sense of powerlessness mm -mm. absolutely yeah. what I came to appreciate was the power I did have and how I could exert it and how I could use it so instead of making me feel powerless, it made me feel more powerful. Yeah. What I saw too, I did mention it uh, uh, in a good way, that people, some people got a psychosis, but could go through it without mm. anyone interfering, just going through the process. And then yes. they could, uh, could get out of the psychosis. So you can read the stories on on, uh, on the internet. So that's, well, sometimes, well, I know it in my work that sometimes interfering with psychosis, it makes it worse. So uh, and what many people have with uh, lived experience say, well, just be there and not interfering. And uh, well, I think that's true. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a question. Uh... Uh, referring to this, um, uh, Jose Hoekstra uh, asked, asked uh, this question, working with peers, uh, a few of them suddenly had a kickstart in recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I felt that their lockdown confronted everybody with themselves. Uh, for some, these were uh, very positive. Well, you told about it, uh, Margriet. Uh, for others, it was difficult, especially uh, for the people with psychosis, uh, it was positive. Uh, people with fear uh, became more afraid. I wonder if this uh, ex is the experience of, uh, all to, uh, of, uh, of you to all. Well, it came out of Trimble's uh, uh, research. It was also uh, the, the finding of, of the Trimble's research that people who had uh, a neurosis, well, I, just as a psychiatrist, so I talk about diagnosis, uh, but, uh, but people with uh, psychotic uh, experiences did, did far better. And people with fear, they were more anxious. And has everybody the same experience as far as you have them? I don't I, know. I, I would not say so. I think it's, it's, it's been very different to, for different people. But one point is that um, uh, psychosis is all, all the time raising questions like existential questions, like Ludi said at the beginning. So people that are afraid of existential questions, they are more afraid. But if you have already met some existential question, then, well, you're ready to, to meet uh, the, the, the problem of life, death, and what is important in life, and what is not, and what is real human connection. So if you know something about that, then you will, uh, well, go through this uh, problem better than if you are just afraid of, of all these questions. I agree. Somebody is asking here, uh, Will is, uh, is asking if, uh, uh, if we think that only people that did well under the pandemic sent their stories because there was so much positive. Mm. <laughs> That's interesting. Mm. What do you think? Yeah, I think that uh, I think there is uh, people who did well send in their story, but there are also uh, some stories of therapists, uh, some of uh, working in uh, in a hospital, and they said that uh, there was also more equality because uh, people outside the hospital and in the hospital had the same paranoid beliefs about. Uh, bad researchers in uh, Wuhan who uh, sent the uh, virus to us. So they were, they were all alike. 
And there was another story also um, commenting on how the, the anxiety was getting really bad at, at the beginning and it was also not very uh, positive or all, all the time. It was some quite frightening times and also psychotic episodes during the uh, pandemic. And, but, but, you know, they were, uh, they were asked to, 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 to put it in a, maybe a positive way. How, how can we learn from it and what has it learned to you? But also, you know, that they found some uh, resources within themselves. And I also think that when the society went into lockdown, it made the whole world so much more, uh, I mean, manageable maybe because it wasn't, you know, the, there wasn't so much pressure people were talking about in the stories and, and you know, it was the whole surround, all the surroundings were so much calmer and that helped as well. And there is other research of, of uh, in the Netherlands, and that's a panel. And uh, uh, it's a panel which answers questions all about all other things, all kinds of things, and they are just drawn from all kinds of layers of of, of uh, all kinds of, of people are in it. So they are chosen, and uh, so that's. Uh, but there must be further, further research, and uh, Trimmels Institute like to uh, to research. To, is very curious about this and wants to research it further. And then, of course, they will uh, uh, ask people who are uh, uh, have bad experience. Of course, that's that's research. Yeah, that's important too. But but there's a question for you here, Margaret. Um, uh, uh, somebody's asking, do you think that medication can make the psychosis, psychotic symptoms worse? Would you like to answer that? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's, that's a very difficult question. Um, well, I worked in, in crisis, uh, in, in, in crisis teams and where and of course, I, I forced as a psychiatrist to give medication because everyone says, do something about it, uh, doctor. But uh, you give a message when you give, when you give uh, medication. You say what, uh, what you tell us is, is not true. And uh, well, you, you, uh, you, when you, uh, you, you don't comment on it, you uh, are uh, in a position that uh, as the uh, torturer in 1984. So how many fingers put I on? Oh, uh, the wrong ones. So I, I will give you hell doll. So, um, <laughs> so, so it's the way you give medication and um, of course, not too much. When you give too much uh, medication, then the uh, emotions are blocked out. So people can't uh, manage uh, also their uh, um, uh, psychosis. Uh, well, sometimes you can stop it. And uh, what is very important is a good dialogue about it. And uh, there is so uh, there, there was a, a hospital in the in the Netherlands where uh, people did not see a psychiatrist for a long time, and they had uh, uh, pots full of, of of medication. Well, and that's well that that's abuse. I think that's abuse. And then they stopped the medication or they uh, lowered it, and people could get out of the hospital. So, uh, yeah. Marguerite, I'm just going to, sorry, we're just going to have to finish off there because we're running out okay, of time. So, yeah. all, all of a sudden, the time is just gone. Oh, so bye. I, yeah, I know. So I want to thank you. I want to thank everybody who's contributed. But I just wanted to finish with a few thoughts because while we were talking, it occurred to me that actually what we are now is, I believe that we have become historians, um, that this is a historical event. And History is about the gathering and, and the collection of stories and stories that will cap, capture the, the, the magnitude of these unprecedented events in our world. But who will be the dominant voice in constructing the slice of history? 
the dominant discourse cannot be science alone. It must be the voice of those most affected. And we must record and report the human impact. Stories connect us as human beings and people's stories and experience move us and generates dialogue, debate, discussion, and it's a way to reach out. It's a way to inform, to educate, it's a way to ask for help. People's stories invite us inside their worlds and lives. It's a chance to listen, it's a chance to be heard, it's a chance to be believed. All disciplines must cultivate the craft of listening. We must listen with our hearts and our minds to create opportunities so people can give voice to their concerns and to show we truly value our fellow human beings. We must encourage people to speak up and not be silenced because that is where the healing starts. No one is immune to these tragic events um, and we must extend support and kindness to all. We must create spaces to talk and exchange views as we've done tonight. Our narratives will enhance and establish a new body of knowledge and a new wisdom. Our narratives will be our salvation and our power. And I encourage you all to continue to write, to speak and to share and to ensure our perspective on, in terms of mental health and well-being, in this historic event is not lost. So I'd like to thank you all for um, contributing to this new understanding and this new dialogue. And I'd like to hand over to Ludi now, who will bring us to a conclusion. So thank you all. Thank you, Ludi. Thank you, Deborah, for your beautiful conclusion at the end of this discussion. It was really <laughs> moving to hear that. Uh, thank you. But thank you all. Uh, thank you also, Ray, for your the way how you did the discussion. And uh, also thanks for all the panelists who are so open and so speaking very free. So uh, I'm very happy this evening because uh, it was a, a great event for me. Uh, I learned a lot. I have written some things here, but I will not repeat it here. Um, I have learned a lot. And what I felt especially was the connectedness. Uh, there were the panelists, but I also felt a link with all the people listening there and writing and the chats and the Q and A's. And it's really a, a new experience for me. So I would invite to do it again. Um, I really loved it. Um, thanks, thanks uh, all of you. Uh, also, the attendees who stayed with us such a long time, it was two hours, so uh, it was a courage to stay so long with us. But the webinar is not the only way to have contact with each other. Uh, we will keep the chats so we can read them afterwards and you can have feedback if you want. Uh, also, there's a recording of this webinar. This will be uploaded on the ISPS YouTube channel so you can see it again. Or Share it with other people if you want. Uh, and I invite you now again to answer a second poll. Um, all the attendees, can you indicate which topic you would like ISPS to consider arranging another webinar on? You have 30 seconds for it. webinar about personal experience psychosis, experience of working with people with psychosis, psychosis as a disability, different approaches to understanding psychosis, different ways of working with people with psychosis, prejudices, discrimination, diversity and psychosis. So and you don't have to choose. No. Put, uh, yes. yes. Yeah. Also the last question I find it also very interesting about the medication. I think we could fill an whole webinar about medication also. It's a hot topic also every every conference also. So uh, yes, but um, please give an answer and then maybe uh, Antonia can already share. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Different approaches to understanding psychosis. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
we will talk about it and uh, I hope we can organize we can organize the next webinar uh, in many places in the world the world is still recovering from the corona crisis but we know that COVID-19 is not over and that new waves or local bursts can happen. What we learned today, I'm sure that we can take it with us as food for our mind during the new challenges. And we hope we shall see each other again in other ISPS webinars that uh, I think we will organize it in the future. And of course, I hope that we will meet each other again in real life not by webinar, but in real life during the next ISPS conference in September 2021 in Perugia. And the chair of that conference, Mauricio, Pe Mauricio Petizia, he promised us that a whole panel discussion about COVID-19 will be organized and at that moment. Uh, but we know also that future is uncertain now. Um, but, and that is my Final conclusion, COVID-19 cannot destroy hope, neither human links. I think that this evening we had really evidence that, that the human links still exist. And I'm very grateful to all of you uh, staying with us. And uh, I say goodbye to all. Thanks and goodbye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.